Hey folks, how you doing? My name's Luke. I'm the repair tech here at Evitz Model Shop in Santa Monica, California. And I wanted to go over today with you guys a few things on a nitro specific, semi nitro specific, but still applicable to just about any RC vehicle you can think of, sort of checklist for a used RC car. Things that you're gonna wanna go over before you pull the trigger on buying that vintage, especially if it's a vintage one, RC car that you may have your eye on, okay? So first of all, this, I just finished another video about this guy, so don't worry, I, uh, I don't wear the same shirt every day. Um, this is an Ofna Ultra GT. It's an 8-scale nitro-powered racing buggy from the 1990s, about 1995-96 this was manufactured and released. Um, it's a nitro car like we talked about, so there are some nitro-specific checks that we're going to be going over. And some general mechanical things that are just good to be aware of anytime you're looking at a used and particularly a vintage RC car. Along with some other advice that I think is pertinent to the ownership of, you know, RC vehicles that are a little long in the tooth, as some people like to put it. So let me look at the outside and see whether or not it appeals to you. That's obviously 100% of the thing right there, whether or not you want to get into it and put in the work that a vintage Nitro RC car is going to require in order to get it up to snuff and keep it running properly and procure parts for it, whether or not it speaks to you in a way where it's going to be worth your time. So in my case, I look at this. I'm nostalgic for this particular car, as I went over in the other video that addresses this car. I like the paint job. I think it's pretty cool. So for me, the answer to that question is yes, this is appealing to me and it's worth my time. Now, <clears throat> let's take off the body so we can have a look at the internals. And this is the important part. So, right off the bat, you're going to notice here's the engine, the header, the pipe, the fuel tank, the drivetrain is going to come right out of here off the flywheel and the clutch and go out to the front and back, and then you have some electronic bits on here. Long and short of it is, and then of course suspension, components, drive shafts, things like that. That's the full list, basically. There's nothing really much else going on with these that you won't notice right off the bat. So as soon as you take the lid off, this is however long you need to take to do this. Just make sure you do it. For me, it's relatively fast because I'm familiar with these vehicles and with this kind of stuff in general. So I just go from the front to the back, just looking all at the, the way that the screws look is important. And <clears throat> just look for anywhere that you might see anything that's broken. Right away, of course, this sticks out to me, this broken shock. I noticed that right away. You can see that without the body on, so that's no big mystery. And I've already replaced the wing. So the old wing is, is put aside, and this isn't the original wing, so that's been replaced, like I said. Um, there are a few things that aren't exactly obvious that you might want to look for. Like, things that really drew me to this particular vehicle, this one in particular, is the fact that it has all the original electronics, at least the original servos. And what that tells me is it wasn't driven excessively hard, because neither one of the original servos ever had to be replaced. It has the original servo horns, so they were never stripped. No dents in the pipe. The exhaust tip here isn't bent or pushed in. And I don't see any kind of real signs of hard stress on it. There's a few like rock nicks and things on the bottom of the chassis. And I see here that somebody at some point probably had to use a Dremel tool to remove one of the engine mount bolts because it's stripped. And a lot of times, anytime you see like damage that looks like this, that could have been a rock, kind of unlikely because of the way it looks, so that tells me that at some point somebody twisted the head off the engine mount bolt or twisted the Phillips pattern out of the engine mount bolt and had to pull it out. So, onto the motor. Now you can see inside the top of the motor here, it doesn't have a glow plug in it. So for our purposes, I'm gonna insert a glow plug so that we can have the correct compression and everything like that for our purposes. <clears throat> So the first thing you're going to want to do when you're inspecting a nitro car, so I like to start in the motor and kind of work my way out like I was saying, and unlike an electric car, the electrical system is a completely different thing and doesn't necessarily have to be active while you're uh, diagnosing other, temper other possible mechanical problems or whatever have you that may be going on with the car. This particular nitro motor has a pull start. There are several different ways of starting a a nitro motor you have pull starts like this one which are convenient for in the field they're easy they're difficult to rebuild and they can be temperamental so those are the, those are the downsides of your pull start starting system box starters are a little bit less common but they're still around racing cars almost always use box starters this was more of a club racer 
So there were more user-friendly RTR versions of this particular buggy available that include, you know, user-friendly, basher-friendly, you might call them today, features such as pull starters. But more serious racing buggies and more serious racing engines certainly would not have included a pull starter. This one does, so we're going to use it. Okay. Give the pull starter a pull, and it should have enough resistance that if you pull it quickly, it can pull the car up off the deck. That's, that's a good rule of thumb for it, you know what I mean? Beyond that, it's an intuition that you're going to have to develop, whether or not the compression feels correct to you when you pull a pull starter. If the pull starter won't pull, don't yank on it because A, the pull starter could be jammed, or B, the motor could be stuck. In order to verify which it is, you can reach down under here and manipulate the flywheel with your finger. Now, if you can turn the flywheel, which on this one I have no trouble turning the flywheel, that's because Dana at Pegasus had already gone through this motor and unstuck it. Previous to that, it was stuck, which is not uncommon for a nitro motor that's been sitting. So this motor feels really good compression-wise. I like how it feels. Everything looks fine to me. So let's move on to the next thing. And before I forget to pull this glow plug out that I threw in here, I'm going to do that and do myself a favor so later I don't forget that I put that glow plug in there if I want to do something different. You know, I haven't really officially started this build yet, so I want to kind of keep things keep things the way they were. So we're going from the engine here. I'm going to move my way over to the carburetor and see what's going on with this guy, okay? Now the first thing I want to do is get out my tuning screwdriver and without going too far in either direction, I'm talking like a sixteenth of an inch either way, I want to manipulate the high speed needle first. Not, you can go in any order you want, but the high speed needle is nice and accessible and it's a very important needle. Now the reason I only move them a little bit is these seals in the carburetor could be dry. And if you excessively manipulate these carb needles with dry seals, you risk ripping the seal and then you have to rebuild the carb. And a, a point that I'm going to just really hammer home a lot with these vintage buggies, well vintage RC cars in general, is it can be hard to find these parts, so you really don't want to ruin anything or throw anything away until you're either positive that you have a replacement, or better yet, don't do it, don't ruin it to begin with. Here's our low speed needle here, on back to our carb diagnosis we got going on over here. That feels fine, that's manipulating pretty well. And our idle set. Idle set feels good too. You can feel it moving around in there, so that's, that's good too. Like I said, only a little bit, don't move it too much. Now we're going to take off the air filter, or the air filter is, you know, like, it doesn't have a filter element, but it has the filter, so that's something we're going to have to install before we reinstall that whole assembly. Now you're looking down into the throat of the carburetor. Now the throat of the carburetor appears really clean besides a little bit of dirt that might have made its way into there when we took off the air filter. Let's see. Inside the actual throat of the carburetor, it looks really clean, really straightforward, and... The dust boot on the carburetor looks to be in excellent shape as well. It's a little worn, nothing you wouldn't expect for the car's age. It feels really good. So now when we move the servo, you can see inside here that the carburetor slide. It's a slide type carburetor. Articulates really nicely. And the servo actually feels pretty good too. Not that it matters because we won't be testing with live electronics. <clears throat> These are the brake linkages here. And the, uh, the brake actuators and the brake discs are on either side of the center differential. You can't just have one because then the other side would spin freely. Because inside of this spur gear area is a center differential. Now we look here. I'm looking at the, uh, the teeth on the spur gear and the pinion gear of the clutch bell. They look to be fine. The brake discs look to be fine. They're not fuzzy or falling apart. And we can manually articulate this servo and verify that we have brake action. Now while I'm holding the servo back and activating the, the brake actuators here, the wheels lock up and the car wants to stop. And you open up the throttle a little bit and let some of the pressure off the brake actuators. The car rolls just fine for the most part. There's a little hitch in the front end that I remember I noticed when I first looked at this. And that's a problem that's going to be addressed when we get into the differentials of this. It's kind of an intermittent drivetrain issue that'll be fixed later on down the road and it's not a big deal because I don't feel anything that feels like horribly out of whack or anything like that on this car. Now once that's done, like we talked about, we have this shock issue here that needs to be worked out and we'll get the parts for that guy. So let's go ahead and check the action of the front and rear differentials. This feels fine. 
Okay, let me go ahead and rotate the front end and there's, see when I said the problem was intermittent, that was our snag. The snag in that front differential or center differential is gone now. So since it's on and off, it needs to be addressed, but that tells me that it's a pretty easily fixable problem. The rear differential articulates just fine. The shocks short of requiring a rebuild and we'll see how well they hold oil or how the seals look once I get into them and look. We'll know pretty quickly where we're at with those guys. And uh, well, the next thing is we're going to look at the fuel delivery system. Now on these uh, on these nitro cars, fuel pressure can be important. It is important. So this is the supply line to the carburetor that's going to run the motor. I'm sorry for nitro guys who are real seasoned on this kind of stuff or know what I'm what what we're dealing with already, but just bear with me. And this is the exhaust pressure line that comes off the pipe and goes into the top of the fuel tank. So the, the exhaust pressure and exhaust gases in this pipe actually pressurize the fuel system. We want to make sure that the fuel tank doesn't have any air leaks. In order to do that, I'm going to unplug, because on this, on this particular vehicle it's convenient to do so. Unplug the supply line that goes to the carburetor. And I'm going to unplug the fuel pressure line that's coming out of the pipe and going into the lid of the fuel tank. I've put my thumb over the outlet here that goes to the supply line and then we're going to go ahead and blow in this fuel pressure line and the tank is sealing until the lid lifts. That's sealing up nicely so that tells me that there are no cracks in the fuel tank down in the seam here and also that the fuel tank seal is doing well and we don't have any problems with that one and so in this, in this case the fuel tank's fine, which is also good news because you don't want to have to track down parts for this because it can be quite difficult. So that brings me to my next point and perhaps the most important point of all, here's that air filter element that we're going to be installing when we get the chance. With these old school and especially these old school nitro cars from companies that are defunct, the most important thing to have is a good supply of replacement parts. So in my box here, you can see that I have, well, not all this stuff is related to the Ofna buggy, but this is an entire Ofna roller. Besides wheels and tires and an engine, it's got just about every part on it we can possibly need. Front and rear differentials. This isn't the exact same car, but like so many RC manufacturers today, there are a lot of shared parts. So I have everything that I could need on here to do most of our mechanical repairs without having to track down or buy a bunch of eBay stuff. And, you know, you just... Another important thing to remember is it can be cheaper sometimes to buy a parts roller, which is what this car started out as, instead of buying your little onesies, twosies, parts and everything like that. Before I ever had my eye on this car, I bought this parts roller for in case I ever found an Ofna GT that was in good enough condition to actually restore. I have found that now and I have my parts car, so all my ducks are in a row to start on this restoration and I'll know that everything's going to turn out as good as it possibly can because I'm prepared. And if you put these steps into into whatever whatever you want to whatever you want to say about it, if you take these steps to heart, do what I said, and just be aware of what you're looking at and do your research, you'll be prepared too. And that's the most important thing when you're doing vintage RC rebuilds and looking to buy used RC cars. I hope this helps. I know it's a little off the cuff, but I think most people would be able to get something from it. I hope you did. Thank you so much, and have a great day. Bye bye.